Well, we are preparing to reopen everything later this summer and to relaunch our ministry to preschoolers and children, students, and young adults. And as we are getting ready for all of that, we are spending some time remembering what it means to be healthy church members. And like the video introduction reminds us, it's not about what I could do or what I might do. It's not even about what I can do or should do. Being a healthy church member is a matter of determining what I will do. I will be a loving church member. Because I know that loving churches are made up of loving church members. I will love selflessly. I will love sacrificially. And I will love submissively. I will love. I will be a worshiping church member. I will worship with a heart that is prepared and burdened by my own sin, burdened for the needs of you, my fellow church members, burdened for our nation and burdened for the salvation of the nations. I will actively seek the presence of the Lord in worship and listen to the Holy Spirit when he brings me under conviction. And I will respond in repentance and obedience. I want to add to those I will statements this morning because I want you to make a commitment that I will grow. I will be a growing church member. This morning we're going to look at a very familiar passage to many of us. It's found in the book of Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 42. Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 42 and reading through the end of the chapter. Dr. Luke tells us, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And I love this last statement. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts chapter 2 begins with the day of Pentecost. By the time we reach the end of the chapter, the day of Pentecost has come to a close. It started with the disciples all gathered in one place of one mind, of one spirit, praying to God. It started with them all together, and then suddenly the Holy Spirit descends upon his people. Now Jesus had promised them that he would send the Spirit who would not only comfort and encourage the people, but would also equip and empower them to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to understand... The Holy Spirit did not come into being at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is eternal along with God the Father and God the Son. He always has been. But prior to this event, prior to Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit would descend upon individuals. The Bible calls it the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit anointed the entire church. You are anointed. Would you say that with me? I am anointed. We as the body of Christ are anointed by the Holy Spirit. And by the end of the day, around 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom of God. Can you imagine 
But it didn't even stop there because verse 47 tells us that God continued to add to their number daily, day by day, every day, those who were being saved. The early church was expanding exponentially growing rapidly, growing numerically, but more importantly, they were growing spiritually, growing in their Christ-likeness, growing in their discipleship. Now, the passage that I just read and the passage that we're going to look at this morning reveals to us a pathway to growth as well as the results of that growth. In the early church, the pathway to growth began with a steadfast commitment. The ESV says in verse 42 that they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. That word devoted is an, is an important word. It, it, it tells us that in the Greek it means that they applied their strength to it. In other words, it was intentional, it was deliberate, it wasn't something that just happened. The truth is, spiritual growth does not happen by osmosis. It does not happen by showing up and soaking in. Spiritual growth, becoming more and more like Jesus, happens when we are intentional and deliberate. Amen. And the early church was intentional and deliberate about spiritual growth. They participated, the text says, in corporate worship in the temple courts. But they also participated in small groups, meeting together in homes. You might say these were the first Sunday school classes, but they didn't have an education building, and they didn't just meet on Sunday mornings. They met in homes, and they met throughout the week. And the health and future success of the Christian movement was tied to those two gatherings, corporate worship and small group gatherings. They didn't look at it as an either-or proposition. Well, I'm going to go to worship today, but I'm not going to go to Sunday school. Or I'm going to go to Sunday school today, but I'm not going to go to worship. It wasn't an either-or kind of thing. Hello? <laughs> for us, it's an either-or. In fact, for us, it's, it's a, a, well, I might not do either one. I might do something completely different. It wasn't an either-or proposition. It was both and. They steadfastly committed themselves to worshiping together and growing together. Amen. I will worship and I will grow in small groups were two sides of the same coin. Several years ago, Tom Rainer conducted a study of new church members. He basically, he, he did a, a poll among pastors and he asked them to look back over the previous five years at everyone who had become a part of the church. And he asked them to look at that and say, okay, now, how many of those are still with you five years later? And of those, how many are involved in worship only and how many are involved in a small group? And the results were astonishing. Those who joined a small group were five times more likely to still be involved in the church five years later Amen. than those who were not. My own experience bears this out. In fact, I was thinking about it this week when I served First Baptist in Talladega. Uh, we, we found out that if someone visited our church, if they did these four things, we had a 100% retention rate. So, so if, a, if a person visited First Baptist Talladega for the very first time, if we could engage them in our hospitality center, then they were likely going to come back a second time. And in fact, if we could engage them in the hospitality center, there was a good chance they were coming back on Sunday night. Yes, we had Sunday night church back then. And if they would come back on Sunday night, if we could get them to go out to eat with us after church at the Mexican restaurant where we went every Sunday night. In fact, we, we, we used to, it started out we would go to different people's homes every Sunday night and then we started going to different restaurants and then we got tired of one church member saying, where are we going to eat tonight? And so we just said, we're going to the Mexican restaurant 
And that's what you know, we took over the place. If, if that guest would come back on Sunday night and then go out to eat with us at the Mexican restaurant, you know what happened? They were going to join First Baptist Church. It wasn't a question of will they, it's a question of when will they. And if they joined the church and joined a Sunday school class, we never lost a single one of them. That's how important it is to be connected. And it doesn't have to be a Sunday school class, but to be connected in some small group where there is fellowship and where there is accountability and where there is growth that takes place. That is a strong pathway to growth. Amen. Being assimilated into the life of the church and being a part of a small group. But listen, it's not enough just to join a group. In fact, we have a policy here at Huffman that if you are a church member, you are automatically a part of a small group. I've never really understood that. Like putting somebody's name on a roll in the class makes them a part of the group. No, it's not enough just to be a part of the group. It's not enough to just join a group. You will not be a growing church member unless you also participate Amen. in the group. So how did the early church do this? Well, it started with Bible study. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now remember, they actually had the apostles with them. So when it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, it was literally the apostles who were teaching. They got to hear Peter preach. They got to hear John teach. These guys had been with Jesus. They had listened as Jesus took the Old Testament scriptures and applied them to the kingdom of God. Amen. And now they are passing that information on to the next generation of believers. And do you know what has happened in every generation since? One generation has passed on the truth once and all delivered to the saints, to the next generation, and then to the next generation, and to the next generation until it has finally come to us. And we have the privilege and the responsibility of passing it on to the next generation. Listen, the most important thing you can do in your small group is to study the Word of God. Not so that you can be more knowledgeable. Sometimes I think we've got so much Bible knowledge that we don't know what to do with it. It's not that we can be more knowledgeable, but so that we can know God more. So that we can encounter God, so that the Holy Spirit can bring us under conviction and change our hearts. That's why the very first thing I asked you to do when I became your pastor two summers ago was to spend five days a week reading one chapter of the scripture every day. And we even laid out a plan for you to be able to do that. It's a very doable and easy plan to follow. And yes, I want you to have more Bible knowledge, but more importantly, I want you to come under conviction. Amen. I want you to repent of sin, to claim God's promises, to change bad attitudes, to obey God's commands, and to follow biblical examples. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, reminds us that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Dr. Brad Wagoner, former professor at Southern Seminary, discovered in his research that daily engagement with the Bible was the number one determining factor for spiritual growth. Amen. Daily engagement with the Word of God is the single most important thing that any of us can do in terms of growing to become more like Jesus. And when we do that on a daily basis, then we're better prepared when we come into our groups for us to be able to grow together as we engage in Bible study. The early church devoted themselves to gathering in small groups to learn the apostles' teaching, Bible study, and to share in fellowship. You and I need community. I think one of the things that we have discovered, especially over the past year, is we were isolated and cut off and alone. And I know for the introverts that was a wonderful thing, but the truth of the matter is we were created to live in community. Amen. 
We were created to be together. We need community. The word in the Greek is koinonia. And contrary to Southern Baptist belief, that does not mean fried chicken or casseroles. Although fried chicken and casseroles are good things. But the word koinonia means more than just getting together. It means sharing the life of the Spirit with one another. And true biblical fellowship takes place best in some kind of small group setting where we know one another and we are known by one another. Where we can find encouragement and even accountability. And listen, a small group can be almost anything in a church. Our, our praise team, our worship leadership team gathers in this space every morning while most of you are in Sunday school classes. What they have is koinonia among that group. There is a special bond among each of them as they share life with each other, preparing to lead us in worship. Small groups are important. But the early church also broke bread together in their small group meetings. Can I tell you this is proof that all of the early believers were Baptists. They had potluck. Everybody brought something. I don't know if everybody brought something or not. I don't know how they did it. But what they did is they gathered together and they broke bread together. It met a very practical need. you got to eat, right? But there was also a spiritual need that was there because not only did they enjoy a meal, but as they closed everything out, they observed the Lord's Supper remembering what Christ had done for them. Church, I want you to think back. For those of you who have been here for a minute, I want you to think back to when Huffman Baptist Church was a thriving church. And if you're new to Huffman, think back to the church that you came from when it was a thriving church. And if your memory is like mine, when I remember thriving churches, I'm always reminded of small groups, we call them Sunday school classes most of the time, where the members spent time with one another outside of Sundays. When Melanie and I were newlyweds, we were members of Calvary Baptist Church in Dothan. Our Sunday school class was the center of our social lives. In fact, everybody that we knew in Dothan, because neither of us grew up there, we moved there as young adults, everybody that we knew of our own age was in our Sunday school class. And our out-of-church gatherings were not limited to planned socials or fellowships. The truth of the matter is that we spent a lot of time together. We hung out with our friends in that class weekly, sometimes even daily. We went to the mall together. We did all kinds of stuff together. The early church devoted themselves to Bible study, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Not the repetition of empty phrases, not the generic God bless Joe, but talking to God about everything. Now think about this. Over 3,000 believers gathering in homes throughout the week, praying, encouraging, holding each other accountable, enjoying a meal together, studying the apostles' teaching. It's no wonder that God was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. But that numerical growth was not the only result of their growth. I've been in churches before that have experienced large growth, rapid growth. Now to be sure, nothing like 3,000. I've I've never preached and had 3,000 come to faith. I don't know what I would do. I'd probably just fall over dead right there on the the spot. So if 3,000 people walk in, y'all don't expect to see me anymore after that. I'm going to heaven. But here's what I've noticed. Whenever a church experiences growth, no matter matter if it's a lot of growth or a little growth, but whenever a church experiences true growth, it usually involves people who are different than the ones already gathered. That was certainly the case at Pentecost. 
Most of the original believers at the start of the day, they were Jews from Judea and Galilee. So they had a common language. They had a common cultural heritage. They all looked alike and talked alike and thought alike and acted alike. Sounds a lot like the American church of the previous century. Everybody gathered together in their homogeneous units, their groups where everybody is the same. But by the end of the day, by the end of the day on Pentecost, there were thousands who had come into the fellowship from what verse 5 in chapter 2 says, from every nation under heaven. Wow. That word nation is the Greek word ethnos. In a single moment, the New Testament church became multi-ethnic with people who lived in foreign lands and who spoke foreign languages. Now you want to talk about a recipe for disunity? That's 3,000 people who didn't look like everyone else, didn't talk like everyone else, didn't think like everyone else, did not act like everyone else. Yet the text tells us in verse 44 that even after all of these diverse people came into the fellowship that all to get, they were all together and had all things in common. What happened? You see, the result of their spiritual growth was they experienced the unity that comes with being in perfect fellowship with the Holy Spirit and with each other. And that was only possible because of their spiritual growth. Amen. Their growth also led to incredible generosity. Now, if you think about it, that makes an awful lot of sense. The more you and I come to understand how incredibly generous our God has been with us, how wonderfully giving He is toward us, Whenever we understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus, the more we understand how to be generous with others. I mean, if somebody has been so generous with me that, that the free gift of eternal life would be given to me, how can I not be generous with others? How can I be stingy? How can I hold on to things? How, how can I not be generous? These early disciples were eager to sell their possessions in order to meet the needs of fellow church members, even those they did not know. So their growth led to unity. Their growth led to generosity. And their growth led to joy. Amen. Not only did they have generous hearts, the, verse 46 says that they had glad hearts. Happy hearts. I know we used to have a choir here called Happy Hearts. That should be all of us. We're happy hearts. Now, I know you've met some, and I've met some Christians before who did not have happy hearts. They had no joy in their lives, but I've never met a truly growing Christian who did not experience the joy of the Lord. These early Christians didn't just have joy, they expressed joy through praise to God. They didn't take their spiritual fortune for granted. They knew what God had done for them. They realized that Christ had died for them, that he had set them free, that he had placed them in the body according to his own design. They realized that he is the one who had established the unity of the Spirit, of the Spirit and so they praised him for it. They were happy and healthy church members. Here's a thought, to be happy and healthy. And the result of that was that they experienced favor with all of the people. I think sometimes, in fact, just thinking back to the Southern Baptist Convention this past week, A lot of times people hear about us Baptists and they think, well, they're always fighting with each other. 
And truthfully, throughout our history as a denomination, we, in fact, there was a book written many years ago, I read it when I was in seminary, come, called The Battling Baptists, because we went from one controversy to the other, to the other, to the other. And, and I know churches that are like that. They go from one controversy to another, one fight to another, and they're known as the Battling Baptists. And when you're known that way, you don't have favor with the people. I mean, come join our dysfunctional family. Come be a part of our food fight. Come be a part of how we hate one another. But that's not what happened in the early church. And praise God, that's not what happens here. Amen. They were happy and healthy, and as a result, they had favor with all the people. But it wasn't just that they were happy and healthy. They also had the power of the Spirit in their lives. And it showed. In fact, Luke says that wonders and signs were taking place. Simply put, what that means is that God was doing things in their midst that could not be explained in human terms. Church, can I tell you that when we are growing, we are happy and healthy and filled with the power of the Spirit. And when that happens, people notice. And they see what God is doing. And they are drawn to Him. They see our good works and they give praise and glory to the Father. I will grow. And I will grow in a group with other believers. Several years ago I was having a conversation with a young lady who um, was a part of a church, but she didn't really want to be a part of that church. And so I was having a conversation with her, and, and she, was, she was beginning to grow in her faith, and I was having a conversation with her, and I said, so help me understand why you will come to worship and sit in the back of the room and then leave as soon as the service is over, and you won't come and be a part of a small group. Help, help me understand what's going on. And she began to explain that that her mother-in-law was also a member of the church. And to know her mother-in-law, you would understand why she was a little hesitant to get fully involved in the life of the church. Her mother-in-law was, um, she ruled the family. She ruled the church. She really did have a good heart, but she just, she just had her way of doing things. And there were some inconsistencies in her life that the daughter-in-law said, if that's what it means, I don't want to be a part of that class. And so I simply said to her, don't let someone else's sin keep you from growing as a believer. Amen. Now through the years, I've encountered church members who say, well, I used to be a part of such and such class, but... You know, I had a bad business dealing with someone in the class, or I didn't like something they put on social media in the class, or, 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 or. And I simply say this, don't let someone else's sin keep you from growing the way you need to grow. Amen. And to those of us who are in a group, don't let your sin keep someone else from growing. Because the truth is, the longer we are walking with Jesus and the more we are growing to become more like Him, those inconsistencies in our lives that tend to turn other people off should be going away as we become more and more like Jesus. I will grow. I will love. I will worship. I will grow will you again don't let someone else's sin keep you from growing father i just want to thank you today for the gift of your church lord for making each of us a part of your body and God, for giving us the ability to grow together, to become more like Christ.
Father, I pray today that if there's someone either in the room or watching online who's never placed his or her faith in Jesus Christ, God, I pray that they would come under the conviction of your Holy Spirit in this moment. But Father, for those of us who've been a part of your church for a while, or maybe we've stopped growing like we should, maybe we've just kind of fallen into the habit of church. Father, I pray that in this moment we would be willing to embrace your design for us to become more like Jesus. That we would be like the early church. Lord, speak to us in this moment.